Welcome to the lecture series of Public Theology, a cooperation of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, the Bayer's Now Day Center for Public Theology, and the Lutheran World Federation. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants in this lecture series on public theology. Let me just start by introducing myself. I am Henrik Simojoki, Professor of Practical Theology and Religious Pedagogy at the Faculty of Theology of Humboldt University in Berlin. I am pleased to speak to you in this video about education, a topic that is not exactly the first thing that comes to mind when one thinks of public theology. As you have learned in other contributions to this lecture series, public theology is a theoretical concept or, to put it precisely, a discourse paradigm that has been developed and is currently controversially discussed by adults in church and theology. Seemingly opposed to that, education is a practice that is centered on children and young people. Hence the question, public theology and education, how do they fit together? In this lecture, I give you five answers to this question. As you already know from other lectures in this series, public theology is much, if not all, about context. Therefore, I will link each answer to a specific setting. Since this lecture series has a global audience, potentially spread over many countries and continents, our tentative exploration will not start here in Berlin, where I teach and work, but in another metropolis far away. In the run-up to the Reformation anniversary, uh, students from Protestant schools worldwide were asked to raise their voices for a better future. They were encouraged to express their protest against grievances in today's world, church and school, and develop ideas for a better future like Martin Luther did in his day. By the closing date in March 2016, submission had been received from more than 53 schools from five continents. The compiled thesis can be found on the homepage of the global school network GPEN Reformation in three languages and a PDF file of more than 100 pages. These theses from all over the world show impressively, eloquently, and sometimes bluntly what angers and moves and worries Christian students in very different contexts of today's global society. They also let us see and feel where these young people put their faith in, what they long and what they hope for. We protest against corruption in school, in church and in our country. This is the first of 15 theses sent in by students from Mabanga Primary School in Goma, Democratic Repub Republic of Congo. In the other thesis too, the authors, all younger than 15 years old, do not mince their words. They unsparingly denounce the conditions in which they grow up. We say no to killings and insecurity in our country because of the selfish interests of some people. Teachers also get their share. Many teachers do not respect the rights of children. They punish uh, children without a valid reason. In contrast to most of the submissions from European schools, their protest against rampant grievances in their own world is rooted in Christian faith with particular emphasis um, on the teachings and exemplary life of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, this applies in particular to the criticism of the church which runs through many of the theses. Some pastors saw hatred and tribalism among Christians, whereas Jesus came for everyone. The marginalization of children lamented by the students can also be experienced 
in the church services. Children are despised in churches. They are driven out to the benefit of old people who come to occupy their places. For God, there is no children and no adults. Among others, Thorsten Meyreis, my dear colleague here at Humboldt University, has highlighted the prophetic function of public theology, referring both to the particularity and to the partiality of its claim to orientate in the public sphere. It is therefore important that public theology, and this is the first answer to the initial question of my lecture, does not close itself off to the prophetic voice of children and young people. As in many other countries, uh, the Fridays for Future movement has been of remarkable transformational force in Germany, not only in society, but also in church. Here young people have made themselves heard loud and clearly in a way that has resonated strongly in both theology and pedagogy. That young people are represented in theological thinking is, however, anything but self-evident. The danger of overhearing their voice is particularly clear in the case of children. This insight leads me to the next setting and the next answer. As is the case all over the world, both public and private life in Germany is currently dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic. For more than a year now, the question of the right strategy to contain the pandemic has been the subject of intense and controversial debates. If one looks at how the perspective of children is addressed in these debates, a glaring imbalance comes into sight. On the one hand, education has been one of the most contested uh, topics in this discussion, particularly on the question of whether schools should be opened or closed, opinions diverged widely and still do. Yet much less attention has been paid to the genuine concerns, feelings and hopes of children in time of pandemic. This applies even more to the theological debate on the interpretation of the COVID-19 pandemic. In Germany, some theologians, such as Günther Thomas, have even gone so far as to outline a specific, as we say in Germany, corona theology. However, in the whole public discourse on theological interpretation of the global pandemic, the experiences and perspectives of children are only marginally considered. The reason for this is as simple as it is far-reaching in its consequences. Like all theology, public theology is developed and debated by adults who explicitly or implicitly argument as adults and develop theories that mirror their own world, understanding and life perspective. Since children do not have a direct voice in theology, theology has to find ways of adequately representing them. In this context, I want to particular um, emphasize the adequateness of such representation. If public theology really wants to be a theology for children, it will not be enough to construct the children's perspective by well-meaning assumptions and generalization from above. Rather, this perspective must be obtained from below in interaction with children as interpreters, yeah, as interpreters of their own life and reality. Under the conditions of a global pandemic, public theology should put much effort into seeking to understand what moves children at this time, what worries them, and not to forget what gives them hope. Such a meaning-based approach uh, to the children's interpretations and experiences of the pandemic is the prerequisite 
of any claim to represent them in theological thought. This underlines once again that public theology, which has been mainly developed in the theological field of social ethics, needs a strong empirical foundation. From here I come to the second answer to my initial question. If public theology claims to represent children, children must be represented with their own voice. My argumentation so far might raise some eyebrows, since I haven't uh, really talked about education in the strict sense at all. Often the term education is understood in the narrow sense of teaching and learning or now nurturing and bringing someone up. But education in a qualified sense is more. It is about seeing and understanding young people as subjects in their own right. Education aims at acknowledging and strengthening young people in their individual growth. In German, we have a special word for this Bildung, in difference to Erziehung, which refers to the intentional dimension of education. In a way, the concept of empowerment comes quite close to such a subject-oriented understanding of education, putting additional emphasis on self-efficacy and power structures. This clarification provides the basis for the next step in my argumentation. My own approach to public theology is strongly shaped by my long-standing research focus on globalized religion. Since globalization first became both popular and notorious as a mainly economic buzzword, it is often forgotten that this term was initially used in the field of sociology of religion. In 1985, under the heading Humanity, Globalization and Worldwide Religious Resurgence, Roland Robertson and Joanne Chirico attributed the conspicuous accumulation of religious movements and conflicts at that time to the acceleration, accelerating increase of global connectivity and interdependency, which they called globalization. Robertson and Chirico argue that as the world becomes more and more interwoven, Religiously dimensioned questions and universalization discourses gain importance. At the backdrop of an ever-increasing and potentially threatening complexity, the confrontation with questions of universal meaning and ultimate ends becomes almost unavoidable for individuals and societies. Today, Robertson and Chirico would probably refer to the uh, global pandemic, which has raised many existential questions and provoked heated debates about the direction of society as a source of such as uh, Robertson and Chirico called it global telic concern. Following Talcott Parsons, Robertson understands religion as a telic form of cultural reflexivity. In his view, religions and religious movements are an important but by no means exclusive provider of telic orientation. Robertson writes, I quote, the making of the world into a single place constrains religious movements to offer interpretations of that development and of their own place in it, to give it religious theological meaning which may well done in very negative terms. Through the work of Max Stackhouse, Robertson's view on the interplay between religion and globalization has found its way into the very center of the early discourse on public theology. Stackhouse assumes that the dynamics outlined by Robertson decisively change the contextual embeddedness of theology. He refers to the emergence of, I quote, a newly contentious, comprehending public, one that modulates every regional and local context 
and yet is adapted into them and adopted in new ways. Stackhouse emphasizes the orientating and civilizing potentials of theology in the evolving global civil society. As I have pointed out elsewhere, his view on both globalization and theology might be a bit too holistic and optimistic. Nevertheless, I, it, it does provide an apt framework for understanding the necessity of telic education in uh, theological concepts of the public. The global plurality of diverse, sometimes antagonistic worldviews and life interpretations demands increasing, increased reflexivity from each individual Christian. Young people in particular must learn to orientate themselves in today's global society. Therefore, public theology has the educational responsibility to foster their capacities to cope with the manifold complexities of the public sphere and to bring their own views and convictions into the public discourses. Against this background is a central task of religious education in schools and congregations uh, to provide learning opportunities for children, adolescents and adults in which they can dialogically reflect and discuss the tele-questions raised during the corona crisis. One example, answers to the controversially discussed question of the distribu distribution of life-protecting resources such as uh, vaccines uh, depend on conviction-based concepts of human solidarity. If one truly believes that all humans are, first of all and equally, made in the image of God and are by that endowed with an unviolable dignity, then one can't really feel too much joy about the favorable supply situation in one's own country compared to others. Another example. The quest for the telos of humankind, which has become virulent during the global pandemic, is determined in the Christian faith by the universal metaphor of the kingdom of God. The gospel unfolds images of global ends that do not stand in linear continuity, but are also not unrelated to our globalized present. They can serve as positively irritating impulses for young people and why not also older people to develop their own images of global well-being, thus helping them to make sense of and also to critically assess the reality they're facing. After having broadened the perspective to the global horizon of theology and education, I now want to deliberately narrow it on the German discourse on public theology. This is because it is remarkable with regard to the topic of this lecture. While education is a rather marginal aspect in the international debate on public theology, the educational dimension plays a prominent role in the German discussion. There are many reasons for this, one of which certainly needs to be emphasized. As in many other countries, but by no means all, there is a separate subject for religion in German schools. However, in Germany, religious education has a, how should I say, particular particularity, because it is not taught about religion. Rather, this subject is taught, as the German constitution states, I quote, in, a, in agreement with the religious communities, which is why RE teachers for Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, and also Islamic or Jewish religious education are trained at theological faculties and institutes. This contextually shaped connection between religion, the public sphere and education in the German model of RE in public schools contains specific opportunities and challenges. 
On the positive side, the overall task guiding school education, namely to support young people in leading their lives in a self-determined, reflective way and according to the ideas of the good uh, that guide them, includes the religious dimension of human life. The challenge, in turn, lies in the fact that the recourse to a particular tradition is coming under increasing pressure in the face of advancing secularization, pluralization and individualization. To put it more concretely, religious education can only legitimize its place in the public school system if it visibly fosters the student's capacity to dialogically reflect and express their own points of views in the existing plurality of religious and non-religious orientations. Against this background, it is not surprising that the seeds of public theology have particularly sprouted in this environment. Since uh, 2010, several concepts of a public religious pedagogy have been presented in Germany, among others by Bernhard Grimme, Judith Könemann, Thomas Schlag, Bernd Schröder and others. To present them all here would exceed the scope of this lecture by far. Therefore, I will focus on the approach of Manfred Pirna, who has been developing his understanding of a public religious pedagogy in recent years and has founded a research unit for public religion and education at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. The starting point of his reflection is the question of what holds a liberal, democratic, pluralistic society together. In his answer to this question, he draws back to two prominent philosophical frameworks. On the one hand, the thesis of late John Rawls that coherence and solidarity in pluralistic societies are dependent on an overlapping consensus between citizens with different religious and non-religious worldviews. And, and on the other hand, Jürgen Habermas' concept of translation as a dialogical, cooperative individual endeavor of religious and non-religious citizens. Pena argues that in these political theories and their counterparts in public theology, I quote, the task of education and learning is implicitly present. He emphasizes the role of public education, I quote again, as it provides the young uh, generation with a learning model of how diversity in society is dealt with and on which basis living together is possible. But that is only possible if strong truth claims and particular convictions are included and are addressed in public education. Hence, the necessary link between public theology and RE in public education, which includes two directions. On the one side, public theology needs to be aware that its anticipations of a public faith or even a public church rely on competencies that are acquired in learning processes. On the other side, Pirna recommends public theologies as reference theories for public religious education, since they are firmly, I quote, grounded in their own religious tradition and at the same time offer translations into other religious and non-religious understandings of life and the world. On this basis, processes of translation between different religious and secular languages become a major task of RE in public schools. So such processes go beyond of what Heinrich Bedford Strom has called bilinguality, meaning the capacity to translate religious language, language into generally and rationally accessible, albeit secular language. A dialogical and cooperative translation in the context of public religious education in schools 
also includes inter- and intra-religious differences and consequently should have a strong emphasis on religious plurality and interreligious dialogue. Finally, I come to the last step of my argumentation, which is somewhat more fundamental and general. For a long time, public theology tended to, how should I say, think big. The aforementioned Max Stackhaus being a prime example. Until today, the public of public theology is often conceptualized discursively in singular and, as indicated, rather big as the public sphere, the public square, the public forum, the public realm, etc. This does not change much if one splits the one public sphere into several sub-publics, as David Tracy does, who distinguishes between three publics that theology as a public discourse has to be sensitive to, the church, the academy, and the wider society. For with regard to all these publics, the basic aim is the same, to dialogically engage with them and to make the orientative voice of theology heard. This aim is completely plausible and not to be criticized because public orientation has always been an essential core business of theological ethics. However, religious education, as has become clear in this lecture, does not construct the public sphere primarily out of an orienting interest but with regard to education. Therefore, the public is not primarily conceptualized as a theoretical discourse, but as a discursive practice. As Ingrid Schobert, my colleague from the University of Heidelberg, has pointed out, Charles Taylor's understanding of the public sphere provides a sound basis for such an approach. The public is then the modus in which plurality becomes real and viable. While public theology is often metaphorically located in public forums and arenas, Schobert points out that the public sphere as a specific form of discursive practice can only exist in the plural and that it, that it is the smaller publics that are particularly important from a pedagogical point of view. Therefore, dinner conversations in the family, classrooms, in schools, discussions in youth ministry lecture rooms, or debates in a university seminar can be understood as educational spaces in which public materializes as practice, as a communicative practice in which, at best, young people speak and are heard, in which minorities have their say in which narrations are articulated and resonated, in which a culture of recognition is practiced that allows even hard differences to be negotiated. In my own understanding of both public theology and uh, practical theology, orientative and praxeological approaches complement each other. I conclude, in this lecture series, I have given five answers to my initial question why education should matter in public theology. The first answers were about being attentive to the prophetic voice of young people and representing children by giving them a voice or tracing their voice by empirical research. I then pointed out to the necessity of dialogically fostering Telic reflexivity uh, and positionality in the manifold complexities of a globalized world and more generally of linking public theology and public education. Finally, the field of education exemplifies the insight that the public takes shape in practices and needs to be practiced to take shape. Since I have chosen a rather thetic 
and somewhat affirmative approach to my lecture, I want to finish it with a warning uh, that would deserve a lecture of its own. Whenever theologies or religious institutions aim to influence public discourses or even the public opinion by pedagogical means or programs, there are inevitably interests at play. Therefore, educational claims in the name of religion or theology should be first treated with suspicion and caution. In the German history of theology and education, programmatic attempts of linking theology with public education have mostly been guided by anti-pluralistic intentions or motivations. Thus, such attempts in the present need to be critically questioned and thoroughly scrutinized. If each of my answers provoked a critical query from you, this lecture certainly would have achieved its goal. Thank you for your attention.